We're back. We're talking with Cleo Pascal, a preeminent expert on a subject matter that more and more of us need to be paying close attention to, and that is the progress that the Chinese Communist Party is inexorably making in achieving a dominant position in a very strategic part of the world. Um, it's the area between what uh, has been known as, well, China, of course, but the first island chain and the second island chain. And just say a word about the strategic significance of those chains as the Chinese see them, Cleo, and uh, how this fits into the larger strategy you were just speaking of. So if you're, if you're looking out from the Chinese coast, uh, what you would see if you're looking at a map is a whole chain of islands. This first island chain, it goes from Japan through Taiwan, uh, um, through the Philippines and on down, and it constrains you, the PLA Navy's activities. You have to pass and pa through channels that are held on either side by countries that are inimical to you. So breaking the first island chain is essential for the PLA Navy, which is clearly China's military focus. It, it, it launched more surface ships in the last four years than the entire Japanese Navy has combined like it, it is the size of it is, is indescribable it's, it's launching seven to one compared to you to the u.s navy so it clearly thinks the navy is important and in order for the navy to be effective it has to get out of that first island chain that's one of the reasons why capturing taiwan is such a high priority in order to break the chain beyond that you start to get to some of these other islands including parts of the united states like guam Guam is U.S. citizens on U.S. territory. And I don't know why there wasn't more outrage when the Chinese released a video about bombing Guam. That's, they're talking about bombing the United States. Uh, you also have the Marianas. And you have three freely associated states, Palau, Marshall Islands, Ferris States, and Micronesia, that have deep and close bonds to the U.S. They, their citizens serve in the U.S. military at rates higher than most U.S. states. So you have these all of these islands that are... Deep, are either part of the United States or deeply connected to the United States, that China needs to dominate strategically if it's going to achieve its maritime goals, which, according to what we can see, are uh, the key point of their military strategy for hegemony across the region. Yeah. Um, and, and just a further word about this naval buildup that the Chinese have been undertaking. Um, I think it was Stalin who said that uh, quantity has a quality all its own, but how would you characterize the actual capabilities, ship for ship, of these uh, new warships that the Chinese are introducing into their fleets. Are they of comparable capability, would you say, or perhaps in some cases, perhaps even greater than so, our own? Yeah, so there, there, are two, there, there are two elements to that. One is comparable ship to ship, and, and of course, the U.S. still has you know, technology that is, that is very, very impressive, uh, which the which China's been trying to steal and develop and, and, and develop alternatives. And, yeah. Uh, and, and also with, with Russian, I mean, if the, the closer Russia and China gets together, the, the better the Chinese capabilities will be because they might get a hold of some of that Russian high tech that, that, that the Russians are still keeping close to their chest. Uh, but, and there is, and there's the official Navy, but then there's also, they use the fishing fleet they, because of their doctrine of civil military fusion. The, the quantity is very difficult actually to quantify because a lot of their commercial vessels could be used as roll on roll off vehicles for Taiwan. The fishing fleet can be used to swarm. And then what are you going to do? Shoot civilians. That's a war crime. You know, they, there's, there's this deliberate of the three warfares, that third warfare, the lawfare de, de, creates this gray zone effect that makes it difficult to know where to push back. But the key element, actually, I would argue, is political will. You know, you can have a much smaller navy, but if you're willing to use it and the other side isn't, then that's really the only thing that matters. Right. And use it effectively and arguably, hopefully, decisively in our case. Um, Cleo, let me cut quickly to the chase. Um, you've laid out a theater of operations that I would argue probably most of us have been ignoring, with the possible exception of sporadic interest in Taiwan when it seems as though it might be imminently under attack. But the game that the Chinese have been playing with respect to this island hopping campaign and political warfare and dominance through non-kinetic, unrestricted warfare suggests that um, 
all of this is going to become much, much more strategically important to us. What would you recommend the United States be doing right now to try to counter what the Chinese have been up to with this campaign and hopefully thereby stave off some of its ambitions for the region and beyond? To understand what's at stake, it's useful to go back to what Admiral uh, Keating testified before Senate in 2008 about, which was he said that uh, that a Chinese official had come to him and sort of said, uh, why don't you take Hawaii East and we'll take Hawaii West and, you know, we'll help you patrol and secure the region. And I think that is actually their goal for the Pacific. And if you can grab these islands, you can you can make it much more difficult to resupply Australia, New Zealand. You can almost blockade Japan. You can block off access out from Hawaii. This is the front line. This, the, strategically speaking, this if you look at a map, this is what's between China and the United States. Um, and so how do we, how do we make sure that um, this doesn't fall into a Chinese sphere of influence? You look at what is actually great about America, which is democracy, transparency, accountability, rule of law. And you help the people of the region who don't want to fall under the Chinese Communist Party's sphere of influence to fight it with us. So in the case of the Solomons, for example, there's a, there's a lot of uh, drama around this space. The people who want the, the Chinese to be in the Solomon Islands are a very, very small group, maybe a dozen people. And they just happen to be the elite at the moment. But they're not popular with their people. If there's an election, they will go. So instead of over-securitizing, I'd, I'd argue over-democratizing would be the way forward and publish articles about corruption, the leadership and all that sort of stuff. And at the same time, make sure that our existing relationships with, for example, the freely associated states are given all of the attention that they deserve. Currently, uh, the compacts of free association, which are the agreements, the financial plans of the agreement that, that link them to the United States are up for negotiation. The administration has appointed a negotiator if those negotiations go badly, there are elites in each of those countries that are sitting and waiting for the next election to bring them into the Chinese sphere of influence. Right now, China is using democracy to increase its advantage. We need to make sure that the people who care about democracy and freedoms are given all the support they can get in order for it to be correct. Vitally important, um, well, recommendation, yes, but also plan for action. And we look forward to working with you to see its realization. Thank you, Clea. Pascal, come back to us again with updates very soon, if you would. I hope the rest of you will do the same again tomorrow. Until then, this is Frank Gaffney.